Hey guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, checking out the new Samsung Galaxy S6 Edge Plus. And as the name suggests, this is a larger version of the Galaxy S6 Edge. So the Plus comes with a larger 5.7 inch QHD Super AMOLED display. So that gives us a pixel density of 518 PPI. This is the same resolution on the Galaxy S6, but of course over a larger display, it's not quite as pixel dense, but 518 is nothing to sneeze at. We get a larger 3000 milliamp hour battery, which is now charged with faster next generation wireless wireless charging. We also get four gigs of RAM and 32 or 64 gig capacity options because there is no micro SD expansion. Everything is sealed in behind this all metal and glass design. We're still powered by the Samsung Exynos 7420 octa-core processor with a Mali GPU. Now, if these specs sound familiar, they're basically the same ones on the Galaxy Note 5, which I just reviewed previously. But of course, the Note 5 isn't available in all markets this time, but the S6 Edge Plus is. The big difference obviously here is that the Edge Plus lacks the S Pen stylus, but trades it for a curved display and some software tweaks. All right, so let's get to the unboxing of the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus. So the packaging is pretty familiar for Samsung. We have a sleeve covering a clamshell box and the color and capacity is indicated toward the top. Also on the back, we'll find all of our specs. So let's go ahead and slip the sleeve off and the first thing we'll need to do is cut some seals along the side. Lifting the lid, the first thing we'll see is our phone in all of its gold glossy glory. It looks really sharp here. This is the first time I'm seeing one of those metallic colors available on Samsung phones. It kind of has this mirror finish and it really does stand out as something really unique. And I think this gold looks especially nice with that curved front bezel which picks up the light. So of course we do get a SIM ejection tool for removing the nano SIM tray at the top of the phone. Below that, we'll find all of our neatly arranged accessories. Up top, we'll find a set of headphones. So these are Samsung's new in-ear style headphones. They look a lot like Apple's earpods. They come in this nice hard shell carrying case, which we haven't seen before. These headphones also include replacement ear tips for adjusting the size, and you do get an inline remote control and microphone. We also get a micro USB 2.0 cable for charging and syncing your phone. And that also accompanies the adaptive fast charger, which will quickly charge the battery from zero to full in less than two hours. Before we take a close look at the phone, first let's boot it up and set it up for the first time. One of the steps in the setup process allows us to add our fingerprint to the fingerprint scanner. So again, training your fingerprint is very easy and quick. Just tap and hold your finger to the home button until it registers. We also get the option Hi, to Galaxy. set up the S Voice voice assistant. So we can train this phone to our voice Hi, with a custom phrase. We also have the option to choose easy mode, which is a simplified interface if people prefer that over the standard interface. So with our device booted up and ready to go, we can see our stunning 5.7 inch Quad HD Super AMOLED display with those curved edges, which looks even more impressive here. They kind of drop off at the edges, so it almost looks like the display is floating, especially with that curved glass. Now the edge is very subtly curved, uh, so it's not dramatic like it was with the Note Edge from last year, which this is replacing. So along the back, unlike the Note 5, the back panel is not curved. The front panel is curved, so it's kind of like a backwards Note 5 in some ways. So of course we have this nice glass panel with that mirrored gold finish. Up top we'll find our 16 megapixel camera with an f1.9 aperture, along with optical image stabilization and 4K video recording. Beside it, we also have an LED flash, a heart rate monitor, and a color spectrum sensor for improved white balance performance. Also behind this glass built in is wireless charging, which supports both wireless Qi and power mat. And this is next generation technology, so it's even faster than the Galaxy S6 Edge. But you do have to buy the new wireless charger for that to work. Now, although it's faster, it's still not as fast as directly connecting the phone to the rapid charger. Now along the left hand and right hand side, we do have these narrowed edges, but they're not sharp or unpleasant to handle. The metal itself has been nicely polished and curved, so it feels really natural in the hand. So along the right side, we'll find our metallic sleep wake power button. Along the left side, we'll find our individual volume up and down controls. Toward the bottom, we have our headphone jack, microphone, micro USB 2.0 port, speaker grill, and of course the antenna insulators. You also notice that unlike the Note 5, we have this sort of ridge that goes down the metal frame. Toward the top, we'll find this nicely fitted nano SIM tray along with a microphone. There is no IR LED blaster, just like the Note 5. On the front toward the top, we have an LED notification light right next to our ambient light sensor and proximity sensor, along with a five megapixel front facing camera with an F1.9 aperture. Toward the bottom, we have our home button integrating the new fingerprint sensor. We also have our backlit capacitive controls on either side. Now dimensionally, both the Note 5 and the Edge 6 Plus are very similar. So if you look at the front, they don't look terribly different besides the curve of the edge. Everything is in the same location for the light sensor, LED notification light, five megapixel front camera, as well as the buttons down below. 
On the back, it's basically reversed. We have a curved back panel versus a flat back panel on the edge. And of course, the cameras, the sensors, the LED flash, and even the branding is mostly the same. Along the edge, it almost looks like they're mirrored versions of each other. Along the left side, we have our volume keys. On the right side, we have our sleep-wake power button, which is in a slightly different location on the edge, which is kind of interesting. Along the top, you can see the microphone has been repositioned and the SIM tray is a little different here. The one on the Note is designed to accommodate dual SIM slots, while the one on the Edge Plus is a single nano SIM. Down below the headphone jack and the micro USB 2.0 ports are in the same location as is the side facing speaker, but you can see the microphone has moved. And of course, we no longer need the space for the S Pen on the right side. Now the Edge Plus is the successor to the Note Edge from last year, but it is a very different device. Obviously there is no S Pen here and we have a curve on both sides of the phone. Now the Note Edge actually treated the Edge display as a separate resolution. So it wasn't integrated like it is on the Galaxy S6 and the curve was much more dramatic. It also had a lot more software features. In fact, you can basically put the entire app launcher inside the Edge screen. Now if you look at them side by side, the Edge Plus display is larger, but not as wide. The Edge Plus is also much narrower than the Note Edge and thinner as well. Along the right side, the Note Edge had no room for the sleep wake power button and instead placed it toward the top, which was kind of an awkward position for such a large phone. But it did have the IR blaster up top as well as the headphone jack. Down below, you'll find the headphone jack on the GS6 Edge Plus, along with the speaker, which used to be on the back of the Note Edge. Along the left side, we'll find our volume controls in roughly the same location, but we do get a new design. All right, so let's take a look at the interface. So this is Android 5.1.1 with the latest version of TouchWiz. Very similar to the Note 5 here. You can see just how quick that fingerprint scanner is. You can also quickly launch the camera app just by double tapping the home button. Getting back to that lock screen, pretty standard stuff here. We can quickly launch into the phone dialer or the camera. We can also see our notifications. So let's go and log in here. Now, like the GS6 Edge, the Edge Plus also features these edge screen features. And as you can see, we have this little tab on the right, which is always present, which you can swipe to activate. So here we have People Edge and Apps Edge. So Apps Edge is new for the Edge Plus. So we're pretty familiar with People Edge. If we tap on them, we have quick access to things like calling them, messaging them, or emailing them. We can also modify the contacts here by tapping and holding on them and taking them up to remove. We can also add new contacts from our contacts list. Now, as you can see, each contact has a corresponding color, which is important later. We have our Apps Edge here, so we can quickly access our favorite apps and swipe in again to jump to another app. Again, this is also highly customizable here. So if I want to drag and drop this to delete it, I can and then add a new app. So I can go ahead and add Gmail again. Of course, we have lots of other settings here. Now we have something called edge lighting. And as I mentioned earlier, each contact has a corresponding color. So if this phone is face down and that contact is trying to contact you either through a phone call, a message or email, the side of the phone will glow in that corresponding color. Now we also have our quick reply options with this. So if you tap and hold the heart rate monitor for two seconds, you can send off this message, which you can customize if you want. Now under People Edge, you can see we can turn this on and off if we want, and we can modify our contacts. So we can go up to Edit and move them around or subtract them to get rid of them. So I can move them around, and as you can see, that color follows that contact. So you can see I'm forever orange. We also have alert when picking up. So if you pick up your phone and one of your favorite contacts has been trying to reach you, it'll actually vibrate and it will give you this little tab along the side indicating you have a recent call, message, or email from that contact. So you can swipe in from that edge to see the details. You can see how many times they called you, messages, emails, and that sort of thing. We also have our apps edge here, and this is of course where you can modify it or just turn it off. We also get something called Information Stream. Now, Information Stream is available from the lock screen. So if the screen is locked and you just rub the edge here, it will actually activate that feature, which includes things like weather conditions, time, date, as well as battery status. And of course, it does rotate the orientation here. Now, I can also swipe between these panels here. So I have my notifications, which I can swipe through. I can have to rub it to get it to move here. And then I can also see my news here. So you can see the news. It does have to update periodically when you bring it up. So sometimes it's not the most uh, useful thing. And it's actually kind of hard to navigate here. So if you want to see the next news story, you kind of have to wait for it to scroll through. Now I can also just double tap on that to launch into the app that's pushing that information, such as notifications or the news stream. You can also manage those feeds along the edge screen here. So for example, we have our notification feed, which you can also modify under settings so you can limit what notifications push to the edge feed. We also have our Yahoo news feed, which you can turn on and off. We have our fitness. We also have our Twitter feed, business news, sports news, Flipboard news, and we can download additional feeds here from the store. There's not a whole lot to pick from though. So you can see RSS feeds for the edge, transporter for the edge, or build news ticker. Now you can activate or deactivate these feeds and reorder them.
We also have night clock, which you can schedule, but basically night clock will display the current time as well as your battery status along the edge screen in a very dimmed state. You really have to be in a dark room to see it. We also can change the edge screen position. So you can change between the left hand and right hand side, and you can also move that tab. So if you want the tab lower on the screen, like on the lower right side where you swipe, you can do that. Personally, I don't recommend it because as you swipe through the screen, you may accidentally activate it. So you may not want it there. We can also limit our notifications for the people edge. So if you don't want to see notifications for messages or emails, you can disable them here. On the home screen, the pretty familiar Samsung layout, but we do have a new icon pack with these sort of rounded icons. A lot of people don't like them. I think they look pretty nice. We also have our app drawer here, as you can see, with lots of Samsung apps, some carrier bloatware, and of course, Google apps. If we swipe all the way to the right, we get to Flipboard Briefing. Now, Flipboard Briefing feeds all of our news stories into one location, and you can tap on any one of them to see the entire article. Now you can manage the feeds here, so you can turn some of them off, you can rearrange them, or you can adjust the content that feeds into them. Of course, you can also just turn this off by pinching in and out to get to your home screen editor. So if we swipe all the way to the right, we can just go ahead and turn that off, and then you can see all of your home screens to the side here. You can add new ones if you want, or you can rearrange them or just delete them. We also have our screen grid, so we can go from five by five to four by five or four by four, so if you want more spaced out icons, you can do that. We also have themes to pick from, so they've given us three, but we can go to the theme store to pick up even more. Swiping down from the top, we can get to our quick setting toggles, which includes things like flashlight, do not disturb, airplane mode, power saving mode, Wi-Fi calling, which is available with T-Mobile and AT&T pretty soon, Bluetooth, auto rotate, mute, location, as well as Wi-Fi, but there are more. So if we go up to edit, you can see we have a few more down here, including smart state, private mode, screen mirroring, NFC, sync, and ultra power saving mode. We also have these toggles for turning off S Finder or Quick Connect or both if you don't want them. Now you can rearrange these, just drag and drop them up here and you can also remove ones you don't want. Now, of course, these do act as quick toggles, but if you tap and hold on them, they'll take you to the control panel. So for example, if you want to schedule your do not disturb feature, you can do so through here. Getting to our navigation keys, of course, we have home. We can double press to launch into the camera very quickly. It's always on standby. You can also tap and hold to launch into the Google Now launcher. We have recent apps here, and you can see all of our recent apps, which we can swipe to dismiss or close all if we want. And then we have back. Now, if you tap and hold the recent apps viewer, you actually get into our split screen mode. So we can select our split screen apps here side by side. So we have a collection of them. So I can open up Chrome and Instagram if I want. I can resize those. I can tap this icon here to switch the windows, like so. Then I can also close, maximize, or minimize the window, like so. So now I have this little floating badge here and I can tap on it to bring it forward again. I can also swipe in from the upper corner to minimize these into window views, which I can move around and resize if I want. I can also press the home button to get this little badge viewer and if I want, I can swipe it up to the top to maximize the window again. Now I can have up to five individual windows open and if I hit the home button, they all minimize into these little badge views so I can move them around or I can tap and hold on them to take it up to delete to dismiss them. We can also access split screen view from the recent apps viewer. So you can see apps that are compatible with split screen will have these little badges next to the close icon. So I can select Twitter here and I can use either one of the open apps or I can select and open another app. So if I want to select Hangouts, I can. You can also say, hi Galaxy. S voice is listening. What's Seek now. What's the weather like today in Rochester Hills, Michigan? Rochester Hills, Michigan will see a lot of sun Friday. So as you can see, we get this little pop-out interface, which we can dismiss by tapping the home screen. Taking a look at our app drawer, of course, we have a whole lot going on. So they've installed a lot of apps. A lot of apps come from the carrier, Samsung, and Google. So some third-party apps as well. I'm not sure who added them, either T-Mobile or Samsung did. But you can see we have folders already for some of them. So we have Google, Microsoft, Samsung, Social, and T-Mobile. So as you can see, we get a whole suite of Microsoft apps, which Samsung has started doing within the past year. We also can modify the folder here. So we can change the color. So if you want it yellow, you can can. And as you can see, the background is now yellow for that folder. Now, if you want to quickly sort your apps by alphabet, you can do that here, but I don't want to do that because I want to keep everything in this custom order. We can also go up to edit here. So if we go up to edit, we now have options like dragging and dropping icons over top of each other to folder them, but we can also disable or uninstall apps from the screen. So if you want to disable this app, you can, but I don't want to uninstall that app. I want to do this app here. So let's go ahead and uninstall. And that app completely uninstalls. Now, not all apps are uninstallable. Some of them you can disable. And unfortunately, you can't hide apps like you could before.
Now we get a full suite of apps and I don't want to go through all of them, but of course you can also go to the Samsung Galaxy App Store to install many other apps that are no longer installed automatically on Samsung devices. We also have S Health, which allows us to use the heart rate monitor on the back. So let's go ahead and measure the heart rate. So again, all you have to do is press your finger to the heart rate monitor on the back and it will read it for us. All right, so 90 beats per minute, that is pretty high, but we also have our blood oxygen sensor here. So let's go ahead and measure that. So there we go, 94% at 99 beats per minute. I probably should measure that again, but we'll do that later. We also get Samsung Pay, which is not yet activated, but should be arriving soon. Uh, with Samsung Pay, it's very similar to Apple Pay. Basically, you use your fingerprint sensor and your stored cards to make secure wireless payment through NFC. But this goes a step further with MST or Magnetic Secure Transmission. So anywhere you can swipe your card with a magnetic card reader, you can actually use this. So basically, it wirelessly broadcasts or transmits the magnetic strip to the uh, card reader, which is pretty neat. Taking a look at our settings panel, a very familiar layout here. We have our quick settings up top for quickly accessing our favorite features. So for the most part, the settings here are very similar to the Note 5. The difference here is that we have edge screen settings instead of S Pen settings. Now, if you go to edit, you can select which settings panel you want up front. And of course, you can also just search here. So if you want to search for display settings, all you have to do is type in display correctly and then tap on it. It takes you right to that display panel. Under connections, we have a pretty standard array of settings panels. Now under Wi-Fi, there is a feature here that I think should be pointed out, and that is smart network switch, which is on by default here. It's off by default on some other devices I've tested, but you can see this will automatically switch between cellular and Wi-Fi to improve performance. Under display, we have some interesting settings for one-handed operation, so you can enable this. Basically, you can reduce the screen size by triple tapping the home button, and you can switch between the left hand and right hand side for thumb reachability. We also have one-handed input. So this will enable one-handed input for certain keyboards like the phone dialer, calculator, as well as the keyboard. Under battery, we'll find our usage timelines. You can see how much time we have left as well. You can also see we have our power saving modes, which we can manage here. So we have power saving mode, which is standard, and then ultra power saving mode, which is more crippling. But power saving mode will dial back screen brightness, frame rates, turn off the touch key lights, vibration, that sort of thing. And you can have it activate at a certain threshold. So if the battery drops down to 50, 20, 15, or 5%, you can activate it automatically, or you can turn on immediately. So as soon as you turn on that switch, it turns on right away. Ultra power saving mode is much more crippling and you can see exactly what it does, but basically it turns off everything, most network features, most apps and that sort of thing in order to give you the best battery life so this phone remains as active as long as possible to place calls or receive messages. So you can see a very light grayscale screen, so mostly black space to preserve battery life and only core apps which are important. Now, if you press and hold the power button along the side, we get to something called emergency mode, which is kind of like ultra power saving mode with some additional features here. So turning this on, once again, we have a very dim grayscale screen. The idea here is to maximize battery performance, but we have some additional emergency options like flashlight, emergency alarm, and then we can do things like sharing your location with your emergency contacts. Uh, we also have our phone dialer, internet browser, and you can add additional apps which may help you in an emergency situation like Facebook, Maps, or Twitter to contact those who may be able to help you. And of course, you can also turn this off or manage your emergency contacts. We also get lots of volume control options here. So we can independently control ringtone, media, notification, and system. Checking out the camera app, we have a lot going on here. So we can tap anywhere on the shot to adjust exposure and focus, and we can manually adjust our exposure as well with this little slider that pops out. Pinch in and out to zoom with lots of resolution to work with, and it focuses very quickly. Snap or photograph, tap and hold to take a burst shot. It's pretty quick. Of course, we can also reverse the camera as well as record video. While recording video, we can snap a photograph, pause it, or just stop it. Now you can record in 4K here, so we're gonna have to go to settings here to activate it. We have lots of options here from UHD, which is the one I want, to QHD, uh, as well as Full HD at 60 frames per second and FHD, HD, and VGA. Now it's important to keep in mind that if you're recording at 4K resolution here, let's go back to the camera, you do lose the option to take photographs while recording video. We have lots of other settings here, including HDR. We have our effects. We also have our timer mode here as well, so you can select all the way up to 10 seconds. And then we have our flash, so we have auto on or off. And then we have our photo size, which goes up to 16 megapixels at 16 by nine. We have lots of modes here to pick from, including auto and pro mode. Pro mode is very cool. You can manually adjust things like your aperture, your ISO level, white balance, as well as your focusing, and you can select your different filters. Now, one of the most talked about new modes is live broadcast. Now, live broadcast actually works with your Google account. So effectively, we're broadcasting live to our YouTube account and we can share this. So for example, if we wanna share this to our Twitter feed, let's go and select it, send it out, and people will get the message that I have a live feed going on and then they can go ahead and tune in.
So while I'm broadcasting live, I can switch between the front-facing and rear-facing camera. Now, what I can't do is interact with the live chat that's available with YouTube Live, uh, but I can see the likes or dislikes. Now, if I go to the YouTube feed directly in the browser, I can see the chat and I can respond to it, but of course, that's not gonna do me much good through this app. But overall, it's pretty good quality and I see about 720p resolution. In terms of the rear-facing camera, so you can see my face here, it does have face tracking. And you can do other features like hold up your palm here to take a selfie. So it starts the countdown, takes the photograph. Uh, we also have the option to tap and hold the heart rate monitor on the back. And when we move our finger, it snaps the photograph. Of course, we can also say shoot. Cheese. Or record video. And that also works with the rear-facing camera as well. And just to make sure that I'm not pulling your chain here in terms of video resolution, here we have QHD resolution at maximum for the front-facing camera. So it's no secret that Samsung makes outstanding camera systems. The Galaxy S6 is one of the highest rated in terms of camera quality. And that's basically the same sensor we have in this camera and delivers excellent results as expected. Images come out clear, crisp with good color reproduction and exposure. Nice depth of field and it's able to find focus quickly and accurately in most lighting conditions. In terms of low light performance, this camera really benefits from the large f1.9 aperture and optical image stabilization, which combines to create very smooth images with good exposure, good sharpness, and color reproduction without over-processing. In terms of video, once again, we can record in 4K and we have optical image stabilization to make handheld video look smooth. And as expected, everything looks fantastic with bright, vivid colors, good exposure and clarity. And the camera is able to find exposure and focus smoothly and accurately without hunting around. What's up guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, testing out the front-facing camera, which is 5 megapixels, f1.9 aperture, which lets a lot of light in. Nice wide-angle lens, does a pretty good job finding the right exposure. Color is good, color accuracy is good, and it's sharp. And again, I'm recording in QHD resolution. So this is an outstanding front-facing camera and probably one of the best I've ever tested. But again, it's the same camera that's also on the Galaxy S6, S6 Edge, Note 5, and this phone. In terms of our Geekbench scores, we do see some really significant gains from the Snapdragon in the Note Edge from last year. 1493 versus 1100, 4812 versus 3315, that's the benefit of going from a quad-core to an octa-core processor. Compared to the Note 5, they're pretty close, although it does seem to be edging out the Note 5 a bit here. I'm not sure why that is, but they do have the same specs. Compared to the GS6 Edge, again, very similar specs here, so we're seeing similar results. And compared to the iPhone 6 Plus, once again, the iPhone beats it on the single core, but falls far behind on the multi-core. Now, in terms of day-to-day -day performance, like the Note 5, there is some evidence of lag here and there, but for the most part, performance is very smooth and quick. Things like the camera app, as well as the fingerprint sensor, work very fast. Animations and frame rate are smooth and quick, and that's one of the benefits of the cleaned up version of TouchWiz we now have, which means performance is much better overall. We also have really impressive gaming performance here with that octa-core processor combined with the Mali T760 MP8 GPU, that's a mouthful. So in terms of gaming performance, again, we're at the top of the spectrum for Android devices. In terms of battery life using a benchmark, I got about seven hours and 19 minutes with the screen set to maximum brightness. That's really impressive. That's an hour better than the Galaxy S6 Edge. This is also much better than the AT&T Note 5 I tested during my Note 5 review. I'm not sure why that is, but I did notice that the display on the edge dimmed during the test, even though the screen was set to maximum brightness with auto turned off. And of course, I turned off all the power saving measures. So this may be a tweak built into the edge that's not on the Note 5, or this may be a T-Mobile tweak that's not on the AT&T Note 5. I'm not sure. Now comparing the Note 5 display to the S6 Edge Plus display, for the most part, it's the same display, the same resolution, the same specs. Both of them look fantastic with bright, vivid colors, deep blacks, and they're generally bright displays, of course, very clear as well. But there are some issues with having a curved display, which I think are worth mentioning. One of them is distortion. So of course, at the edges of the display, because they curve, there is some distortion in terms of light. So sometimes the edges of the display look brighter or darker, depending on the angle of view. For the most part, when you're looking head on, they tend to look darker, especially when you're looking at whites or something light on the screen. You'll also see some color shifting along the edges. And that's because if you look off axis on an OLED display, sometimes it tends to shift colors from green to pink or something like that. It tends to be very mild, but uh, if you're really picky about these things, you will notice it. You also get more glare at those edges. So sometimes that glare can actually block your view of the display. 
And generally speaking, I think the Edge Plus is a little more awkward to handle. And that's because we don't have that curved back like we have on the Note 5. Instead, it's on the front. So the phone is a little wider to grasp. And because the edges of the Edge Plus are actually tapered toward the back, you don't have as much surface area to grab the phone. So you have this really thin edge in which to handle it. So indeed, it is a very slippery phone, but it's definitely a good looking one. Now there is some degree of palm rejection along the edges of the display. So if you're gripping the phone and your palm or your finger are overlapping the display, for the most part, it doesn't register as an intentional press of the display. So in conclusion, there's a lot to like about the Edge Plus. It has an outstanding design that probably makes it one of the best looking phones. There are also a ton of features with Samsung Pay, a fingerprint scanner, wireless charging built in, a fantastic camera system, and pretty good battery life as well. Now personally, although I really like the way the display looks, it's not as functional as the Note 5 and does have some drawbacks as I mentioned. And I do like the way the screen feels. So when you rub your finger across the interface, you have this nice rounded edge. So in the end, this is really mostly a design feature. So it doesn't really add a lot of functionality, but it definitely looks really cool. So that's gonna do for me in this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a like. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again in the next one.